Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. He is our champion. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Well, tonight, if you'll open up your Bibles to Revelation 1 and verse 9, I want to share with you now the last message, finally, I think, from this verse, Revelation 1, 9. I think you'll find it to be a blessing and an encouragement as well. And it concerns the Aegean Sea Island of Patmos. Believe it or not, you can get a message from that. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and endurance which are in Jesus, is really what the Greek says. They're all in him, even the tribulation. Tribulation and the kingdom and our endurance are in Jesus. Paul often speaks in his uh, popular phrase of things, us and things being in Christ. So skipping over that long parenthesis, that digression that we spent uh, several messages on, let me read the verse again. I, John, was in the aisle. That just skips the parenthesis. I, John, was in the aisle. That's I-S-L-E, is, is in an ocean, not in a grocery store. That is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. Again, the better manuscripts don't have Christ. It doesn't make any difference. It's the same one. First, I'd like to say a word on the island itself. The island of Patmos would be nothing. It would certainly not be as well known as it is in the modern world. It would not probably be known by the modern world at all, but by the people that live on it, were it not for an experience that John had here almost 1,900 years ago, 1,895 years ago to be exact. This is a windswept, barren, rocky point in the Aegean Sea. By the way, most of you probably carry Bibles with maps in the rear of them. Uh, if you want to turn back there, you could spot it. Uh, for those of you that like to see where it is, if you find Greece and find Asia Minor, the Aegean Sea is the sea that lies between the two. And if you get over close to Asia Minor, find Ephesus, that large city, then, then look out from the coast there of Asia Minor, look out toward the west, I guess it's probably 40, 30, 40 or so miles, and you'll find, hopefully it's marked there, the small little tiny island of Patmos. Now, it's not Crete, it's not Cyprus, it's not, you know, those are two big islands that Paul had something to do with on first journey. He went by uh, Cyprus, and uh, I guess on the trip to Rome, he went by Crete. Patmos, Paul didn't have anything to do with that. He might have seen it as he went by. That's possible. If you've got a map of Paul's journeys, you can see that Paul did go by there. But it is certainly not anything that holds any significance to it in itself. It's a small, barren, rocky, windswept island that's made up of some ancient volcanic material. There are three ancient, small, um, I guess you could call them volcanoes, but they're small. They're very, very small. They go back evidently a long, long time in history. The island measures about... 10 miles in length from north to south and six miles wide. Uh, that's only up at the northern tip, though, 10 miles by six miles. Now, how many square miles would it be then if it was a rectangle 10 by six? Well, it has 25 square miles. So what that must tell us is that it has an extremely irregular coastline, and it does. If I were to draw a picture up here, it looks like looks like a horse's head, the way a lot of people describe it. Don't think of it as like a little round island. Or those little seahorses that you see in aquariums and things. It looks something like that, but I, I couldn't do it. But it would have all these jagged all the way around it. It looks something like that, a horse's head. You'd think it might have 60 square miles. It's made up of 25 square miles. So that tells us it has an extremely irregular coastline. There is... A narrow isthmus, it's a lot narrower than this, which kind of divides the island in half between the southern portion and the northern portion. And this, as you can tell, is a protected harbor. It was used in John's day. It's still used today, as a matter of fact. And this is where the ancient city was built, was here on um, a, a, an old city of Patmos, here in the middle of this isthmus. The highest point's down to the south, and it's so oh, 800 to 1,000 feet above sea level. What's really important about the island or important natural feature about it is this excellent natural harbor that it has on the east side at the island's midpoint where this narrow isthmus 
connects the northern half with the southern half. Now, at the highest point on the southern end, a monastery was built by some religious people in honor of St. John the Divine, as they call him, in the year 1088, the end of the 11th century A.D., which is still there today, houses some rather important ancient manuscripts, although it doesn't have as many as the collection held at one time. The island was deserted during the Middle Ages. It passed from the Turks to the Italians in 1912, and then it was ceded to the nation of Greece in 1947, and that is the nation to which it belongs today. It has about 3,000 inhabitants today, and practically all of them are Greek. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? That's really why I'm on this for a moment. There's nothing big about it, absolutely nothing. It would hardly ever even be known by the modern world at large today were it not for this experience that the apostle and prophet John had here almost 2,000 years ago. I find that to be rather ironic, and we'll say more about that in a moment. I have brought along some slides, if we can take a look at those now from years ago when I was on this island. You can see what the harbor looks like. You can see what the actual uh, island looks like, the monastery, uh, some of the terrain. One thing you'd have to say about uh, trips over there to that part of the world, to anything that's biblical land, whether it's in Israel or elsewhere, is it is so amazing the, the impression that it makes on your mind or on your consciousness as far as the reality of these things are concerned. Patmos is still there. I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to remove an island. The island that was there 2,000 years ago is still there today. This first slide is um, a shot down the side. We're de-embarking into just little small motor boats off of this giant ocean liner that we were on in the Mediterranean. And this is a view that looks over toward uh, the island of Patmos. Again, don't think of it as one little small circle like I had up here to begin with. It's extremely irregular, and it looks something on the order of a horse's head. This is the ocean liner that we were on. I could probably study and find which window my, <laughs> mine was. I was down there where when the seas got rough, you were underwater. When things were calm, you were above water. <laughs> Places you're not supposed to be, you get seasick, but I don't believe in that, so I didn't get it. <laughs> Let's go on then. Okay, here's a good shot of the island. Uh, the, the harbor's over here to the right. We can't see that yet. We'll see it in a moment. But you can see this, uh, you can see dwelling places up uh, high there and way up toward the top is where you'll find the monastery. Now, whenever we got off, we got in motorboats, went this direction to your right, over to the, um, into the harbor and to the actual little town where maybe a thousand or so people live. The other people are spread out on this island. Got in a bus and went up narrow, winding roads. It's not that far. As I say, it's only 800 to 1,000 feet above sea level, its highest point, but it takes a while to get up there. On the way, you'll stop by the cave, the little grotto that has been venerated down through the ages as being the very place where the Apostle John wrote the Revelation, the Apocalypse. That's debatable whether he wrote it there, but um, being an important cave, and there aren't that many on that island, it probably was the place that John frequented. Here's a spectacular view. We're up on the very top, up at the monastery now. We've climbed our way up. And here, you can see this, see this little isthmus right here? That's what connects the northern half of the island. All this is the northern half with the southern half down here. Uh, here's the ocean liner. We'd get off, we'd be embarked on this side uh, toward the south, and motor boats took us. There's one right there, as a matter of fact. Probably taking some other people left over. All the way up here to the little town then you'd get on a bus and go up. Uh, one reason I took this was not only just would give you good scenery of what at least the northern part of the island looked like, uh, but we're looking toward the direction where uh, John would have come from, and that is toward Miletus or toward Ephesus. That's looking toward the east right there, really looking toward the northeast. And Ephesus is exactly northeast of the island of Patmos. Now, John was in Ephesus according to tradition, and that seems to be reliable for the latter years of his life. Uh, overseeing things. Well, remember in the book of Revelation, he writes to a series of, of churches, and they are right in that area, one being Ephesus, the first being that, but he writes to a series of them there. John's not there, of course, when he's getting the Revelation. John's back over here on the island whenever he's getting the Revelation. So 
So somebody else is, is taking care of the affairs there, and there'd be a local brother or two pastoring the church or churches, plural, that are in the city of Ephesus. Yes. Pardon? Not one you'd want to attend. <laughs> Greek Orthodox, you'd have to grow a long beard. Well, you're halfway there and put a robe on. <laughs> you know, all of that monkish business. Yeah, there are several churches there, but no word of faith ministry, though. <laughs> Was John supervising the church yeah. in Patmos? No. Unless you want to make him the first chaplain in Christian history. We'll talk about that in a moment. Here's where you'd attend church if you were there today. There's where John wrote the revelation over on that napkin. Well, <laughs> you see, they, there's always, you know, it reminds me of that... Uh, eighth chapter of Ezekiel where Ezekiel was carried by the spirit and he goes back and he goes in there and he's fine incense coming out of everywhere that's what this little cave and grotto was all about there's some metropolitan archbishop John Smith Jones uh, 18th in there with a long beard and he's having little services for tourists that come by it's a holy holy place this little grotto is about halfway uh, it's about a half mile if I remember correctly a half mile from the little port that we came into in the harbor down there, half mile up the hill as you're headed toward the monastery. And that's just a natural little recession over there in the corner where you could easily be leaning over that and writing with, a, with paper and a ballpoint pen. <laughs> it's an interesting cave. I mean, whenever, whenever John was there, he seems to have spent between a year and two years, so we'll say 18 months John spent there. That's fairly reliable. So whenever inclement weather came, he had to find somewhere to go, and this was probably where he went. That's rather remarkable. It's really true. I'm not trying to be facetious on that. And whenever you walk in, you feel almost like you're walking on holy ground to think that John was probably in that cave. They probably looked for his bones in there knowing those people. There's a good shot of the ocean liner, and I guess that's back up toward more of Patmos. And I think there's one more. Yeah, that just looks back toward, there's the little motorboats running people back and forth to the ocean liner, back into the port. This was a little town or port, an excellent harbor. Even that big ocean liner could get fairly close up in there. And that goes back to ancient days. All right. This little city right here is not over 100 years old because this has been deserted for years and years until, until, the, until the Turks nominally took it over. And it was given to the Italians in 1912 and then to the Greeks later on. So it's not even a century old. And the Acropolis is in the back. Any other questions before we go? Well, not, not really, no. No. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's turn back here to Revelation 1.9, ask ourselves a question, what's the meaning of the end of this verse when he says that I was in the aisle that's called Patmos for God's word? One view, there are two different views, I'll give you the unscriptural one, then the correct one. One view is that John traveled from Ephesus down to this island so that he could preach the gospel to the natives that lived here. Well, that's nice David Livingston, William Carey romanticism for you, but it's just not true, though. Had it been true, John would have been the first chaplain in Christian history because this island was used as a Roman penal colony. It was an isolated place. It was isolated, lonely, deserted enough uh, that it was not easy to escape from. It made an ideal penal settlement. I guess it's, you could say it like this. It was something like this it was to roam what australia was to the british colonial empire back in the end of the 18th century if you remember anything about british or european history england used australia the down under and outback country as a penal colony they simply took their incorrigible criminals down there they didn't put them in prison or under lock and key with guards they just dropped them off that's a long way to swim back to england i don't think you got uh, too much worry about the thought that well they may get back and 
pick a pocket again on London streets. That's what Patmos was. See, it's a penal colony. And so people that say that John went down there to preach the gospel to the, to the natives, well, the only natives down there were people that had been sent there as criminals by the Roman government. And so I would assume that's the same reason that John's down there. And I think that's what this verse goes on to say. I don't think this verse gives us any of any David Livingston, William Carey romantic ideas uh, of John traveling down to this island to these poor uh, GNC natives and sharing God's word with them. No, the biblical view is found right here in this verse. He said, I was there for or because, or you could translate that on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, again, people say, well, that's why I went down there to preach the word. Well, <laughs> that's really not what the verse is saying. He was exiled here by Asia Minor Roman authorities. Uh, there is much established tradition in early church history that records this. Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, I could even give you the references by chapter and verse in their writings. Uh, Irenaeus, like in his work against heresies. Eusebius in H.E. Ecclesiastical History. Jerome and so forth all told us, and this seems to be completely reliable, and it fits the context in which Revelation is given. John didn't go down there to preach the gospel. He's down there exiled, banished, in a penal settlement for preaching the gospel, and it's under these ironic and unusual and lonely circumstances that God gives to this man this tremendous revelation that makes up our book now. I have more to say about that, the irony of it all, and some principles we can see from that for ourselves here in a moment. But church tradition and these writers to whom I've just made reference inform us that John was banished here in the 14th year of the reign of Domitian, which would be A.D. 95. And the same writers tell us that he was released in the first year of Emperor Nerva, N-E-R-V-A, which was A.D. 96. So he spent between a year and two years, or let's say approximately 18 months. John spent down here on this island. Now, you don't find very many people, if you wonder who holds to that first view, well, not hardly anybody. You won't find very many people who hold to this first view that John is down there to preach the gospel to these people. The whole context of the, of the thrust of tribulation, not the great tribulation, that, that kind of forms the... Um, well, that forms the big picture, and what forms the backdrop to that is what John and these Asia Minor churches are going through at that time. Remember over in chapter 2 and verse 10, I've mentioned that before. John, in each of these cases, or in several of them anyway, with these seven churches, is speaking of the contemporary persecution through which they're going. And here he said, The devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Be thee, fa be thee faithful unto death? Be thee faithful unto death? Well, you don't, you don't always, when you go back and read in church history, have times of either imperial or local persecution, persecution that is severe enough that it results actually in the death of some of those people there. Now, the clear implication that we are to take from, from Revelation 2.10 is that the persecution was severe to that point, that it could actually result in the death of some of those people. And so you say, what's the big deal about that? Well, anybody, whether in biblical history, you know, a student of biblical history or a student of Roman history would know that that's what characterized the end of the reign of Emperor Domitian, D-O-M-I-T-I-A-N, Emperor Domitian. The end of his reign as others like Trajan and like Diocletian was characterized, or like Nero, a better known of those emperors, was characterized by persecution of the church in local areas that often resulted in their death. That's what's going on at least in several places in Asia Minor as we can see from Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. So why not 1 in verse 10, or 1 in verse 9 to be more precise? John also himself, having come from Ephesus, church tradition tells us that, nothing in the Bible does, has experienced similar persecution himself. I believe that's what's true here, that he's been there in Ephesus for the word of God that he preached and the testimony of Jesus that he gave. And now what I think that phrase means is that the word of truth has originated in God the Father 
and it has been so faithfully proclaimed by his son during the days of his flesh. The word of God and the testimony, they're the same thing, of course. They're not two different things. God's word and Jesus' testimony. Jesus testifies to the truth of God. God's word is the testimony of Jesus. And John simply shared the same and proclaimed and preached and declared the same message. And for that, this isn't a happy picture, friends. But for that, he was banished to exile in a Roman penal colony. Now, there's not a lot going on. There's nothing to do on the island of Patmos but just sit. There are a few wells there, a few springs. That you have to make your own cisterns to catch your, the other water that you'd need to drink. You couldn't drink out of the ocean, that's for sure. In John's day, the archaeologists tell us, I don't know how true this is, but the place was treeless. I saw some trees there. They say, well, that's been planted in modern times. I don't know. I didn't live back then, neither did they. But it was not a, an ideal place to be. What are you going to do on the island of Patmos? Nothing. There's nothing to do. There, there are no great towns, no great cities. There are no temples. There's nothing going on there. It's just a barren, rocky, windswept dot in the Aegean Sea, which is just a part of this vast Mediterranean Sea. So taking all that I've said thus far, I, John, was in the isle that is called Patmos for God's word and Jesus' testimony. Uh, I'd like to... I'd like to derive about three points from this, if I may. Three points from this. Trying to put ourselves in this context and understand exactly what John's experience was as much as we can and therefore really understand the meaning of all of these verses in Revelation. First of all, John was well qualified, I would say, to write what he did on tribulation for believers which he did here in the beginning of verse 9. He said, I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. I wonder why, he's, why that's on his mind. Maybe it's because he's in a Roman penal settlement. You generally don't think a whole lot about tribulation until you're in it, right? Then you can write to someone and say, I'm your companion in it, assuming they're in it. It must mean that those seven churches are in it. Why would John say, I'm the, a companion with you? We're partakers, we're partners, we're sharers in the same thing. They're all going through tribulation. And that's because Domitian is coming to the end of his reign as emperor in Rome. And he is persecuting. This isn't an empire-wide persecution everywhere. Sometimes you'd read in a church history book. This is an empire-wide, but at least we know infallibly from the word of God that it does affect some of these local groups in these seven Asia Minor cities where the churches are established. There may have been other places, but it at least includes these. So John is well qualified to write what he did on tribulation for the believer now. And I think that it's John's tribulation, and it's the early church's tribulation, that forms the backdrop for what most of this book is going to be about, and that is the tribulation that is yet to come. Now, that's not to say believers, all believers are going to go through it. Some believers are. Believers were going through normal persecution back then. And if Revelation teaches us anything in uh, chapter 12, it teaches us, and other places in the Bible, it teaches us that some believers will go through the tribulation period, at least part of it, and well, there'll be believers in the whole thing. There's no one for Jesus to come back to. I, John, am your companion in tribulation. And here's why I can say that. Because I was in the island that's called Patmos. And I was there because of God's word and Jesus' testimony. Didn't Jesus tell us himself, friends, in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13? That persecution, that persecution arises for the word's sake. If you're not preaching anything or believing anything, you don't experience any persecution. You don't experience any setbacks or any adversity. The devil just leaves people like that alone. Persecution comes for the word's sake, not for anything else. It's really not because of the color of our hair or eyes that people don't like us. It's for the word's sake. Jesus said persecution will arise for the word's sake, and by and by some people are offended. They're offended. The, the word's too strong, which made the persecution come, which made it strong, which made me weak, which made me give up. So you lost the word, and you lost the tribulation. John's well qualified. Paul had an interesting thing to say over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He write, writes about God as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And he says in verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation." 
so that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The church's ministry is a ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. It is a ministry of comforting one another. Comfort the feeble-hearted, Paul tells us. Paul tells us there that we're to comfort those who are in any trouble because God has so comforted us in all our tribulation. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 4, I believe. John, I'm saying, is qualified. John has had lots of it. Well, this goes way back to the days of Jesus' flesh when John was experiencing some persecution. It goes right through the book of Acts. Remember, John was at one with Peter at the gate beautiful. Whenever they healed that man, he ends up in jail with Peter. He could have said, Peter, be quiet. You're getting us put in jail. The angel of the Lord came, an angel of the Lord, chapter 5, set him free and said, go stand in the temple and teach the people all the words of this life. And I'm sure he's experienced that right down through his life. And as his beard has grown longer and whiter, he's experienced more and more persecution. He has all of that to go upon, all of that as a backdrop to his own life, all of that tribulation. And here he is, we know, toward the end of his life. And he said, I was sent out into a Roman penal colony. Why? For preaching the word of God. He didn't give it up. He didn't water it down. He didn't tone it down. He didn't back off. For preaching the word of God, he said, I was sent out there. Well, the Bible tells us that tribulation and suffering are our lot in this life. Amen. And our lot in the next life is glory. How about some scriptures? A lot of them. Some of these we've looked at before. They're a blessing to review, though. Acts 14, 22. They exhorted the disciples to continue in the faith, and they shared with them this thought that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom. Right. Remember that tribulation and kingdom are connected in verse 9 of Revelation. I'm your brother and companion in tribulation, in kingdom, and in endurance. They go together. We have tribulation now. The kingdom's in the future. There's one thing that brings the two close together, and that's our endurance. You have to endure to the end to be saved Amen. and to enter the kingdom. Romans 5 Two and following, that beautiful passage. I heard someone sharing some of that tonight. Paul talks about us having access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Knowing this, that tribulation works in endurance and endurance experience and experience hope. And what we're hoping for is the glory of God. I just summed all of those verses up for you. Romans 5. Two through five, I guess. I like that. He starts way back there in the, in, in the beginning t telling us where he's going, that we stand in hope of the glory. Now, if you're standing in hope, hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man hopeth for, what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Paul says in Romans 8. If it's a hope for something, it, you don't have it yet. If it's a hope for something, it's still future. And he said, we stand in hope of the glory of God. We're standing in hope of the glory of God. And, and then he goes into verse 3 and he said there are two things now. There are two things that we're going to have to remember as we start headed towards that because we're going to start into some tribulation. But there are two things. And that is we've got to rejoice in our tribulation and we've got to have some knowledge. Look at verse 3 carefully. I'm not even turned over there. I think I know it well enough. We've got to rejoice. We glory in tribulation. That's what the word says. We glory in tribulation. And then he says something else, knowing. We've got to have some knowledge. Our tribulation isn't just so that we can be overcome, that's for sure. There's some reason for our tribulation. It's not just tribulation in a vacuum. Tribulation with nothing at the end of it. We have tribula tribulation for a reason. We have this for a reason. And, and he said, knowing that it works in us patience or endurance. You don't have endurance if you've never had anything to endure. And if you give up in your tribulation, then, of course, you lose. You don't, you don't earn or win or learn anything at all. So tribulation, we know this. It works in us endurance. And endurance works in us experience. Now, how much experience do you think John has by now? A whole lot of it. He's got a lot. He's had a whole lot of tribulation, which worked in him. James chapter 1, 2 and following, whenever you fall in diverse trials and count it all joy, knowing this, a trying of your faith, worketh endurance. Let it alone. Don't bother with it. Just leave it there. Don't, don't fool around with the trial. Just leave it there. 
because we know that it's going to make us a perfect person lacking in nothing. If we'll stay with it, our trials work in us endurance, and if we'll let endurance have her perfect work, then she will make us perfect and entire, lacking in nothing. That's James 1, 2 through around verse 5. Like Romans 5, 2 through verse 5. John's had a whole lot of tribulation, which has worked in him a whole lot of endurance, which has probably made him a perfect man. That's what James says. It'll make you a perfect man so that you don't lack anything. For the continuation of this message, please... John's had a whole lot of tribulation, which has worked in him a whole lot of endurance, which has probably made him a perfect man. That's what James says. It'll make you a perfect man so that you don't lack anything. Because the thing that you don't want to lack is that, is that staying power. Because when you lack that, you give up. You don't want to lack that consistency or that staying power. And you only get that by staying. That's the, that's the remarkable thing about it. If you could... If you could pray, we all would. We would have beat one another to the head of the prayer line. God, give me staying power. He will by giving you a trial. If you pray for patience, you'll get a trial. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says if you pray, because the only way to get patience is by tribulation. My wife and I were joking the other night about that, and we were both saying we both want to be more patient people. I said, well, let's pray for it, but let's hold hands because the house is coming down. You know, we, we ought to want to be people with more endurance. I mean, that's just a, that's a goal in the Christian, but the only way you'll ever get that is by getting some more difficulties. It's not as humorous. It's not just humorous, let me say that. It is, but it's not just humorous. Whenever you hear someone say, well, I, I wanted some, some more patience, so I asked God for some. And then the next day, everything fell apart. It is humorous, but it's not just humorous. It's absolutely scriptural. Romans 5, 2, and 3, James 1, 2, and following. It's absolutely scriptural. If you want more patience, go ahead and ask for it. But what you're asking for in disguise, you spell it another way, tribulation, persecution. That's how you really spell endurance. Because one leads to the other, which gives us experience. John has a whole lot of that, which gives us hope. You know, the more experience you have, the more hope. You've seen what God has done in the past. You know that he'll do it again. He'll do it again. And then what really is that hope toward, though? That hope is toward the glory of God. What we're hoping for in the future is the glory of God. So, something else in mind. Romans 8 and verse 18. For I reckon, the apostle Paul said, that the sufferings of this present age, present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Let me say what I said a moment ago as you're turning over there. I said that the lot of the believer in this life is suffering. Just go ahead and spell it that way so that you don't put a big theological word on there like tribulation or something. It's just suffering. Suffering at people's hands, suffering with all types of misunderstanding, suffering anything that's going to work in you endurance. Whatever it takes that's suffering that'll work in you endurance, God will do it. The lot of the believer in this life is suffering. We're just beginning to look at some scriptures. I'm not nearly through looking at all of them. It says that in the word over and over and over. It was the same for our Lord Jesus. God made the, the captain or the author of our salvation perfect or complete through suffering. Hebrews 2.10. We'll look at that in a moment. I just want to emphasize here for a moment this fact that our lot in life right now in this life is suffering. In the next life, it's the glory of God. That's why Paul, Paul keeps separating this life, the next life. He said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, that, that includes the present time is my whole life. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Now, as you read the context here of Romans 8, it's a post-tribulational glory of God that, is, that clothes his people whenever they return with him and he manifests them to this groaning creation below. Paul tells us God's going to bring all of his saints with him. The Lord's coming back with 10,000s of his saints. Jude said it. Paul said it. Zechariah said it. He's coming back with 10,000s of his saints. When he brings his saints back with him, he's going to manifest them to this groaning creation. They've already experienced, the saints, they've already experienced the glorious liberty of God. The glorious liberty of God. The liberty, the glory that brings liberty, let's say. And they're going to usher the creation into the same thing. 
And Paul said all that we're laboring for, and read 2 Corinthians 11, and you'll see just the tip of the iceberg of the things through which that man went. Beaten and shipwrecked and stoned, and he said, beside all that's without, the care of all the churches within that comes upon me daily. And he said, I reckon, I reckon. Now, he didn't say like, I reckon, like, I don't know about this, but I reckon. No, I'm counting it this way, that the sufferings of this world of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We earth dwellers need to hear that. We earth dwellers, we inhabitants of the earth. We need to hear that because of all the little things we go through and we forget about that this life is just temporary. It's an investment into eternal life. People are always talking about making a good investment and looking to see now, should I invest my money here because I want to reap the biggest reward or dividend possible. Here's the biggest thing you can reap. Invest your life in the kingdom of God because you'll reap eternal reward for that. You know how concerned people are in the money markets trying to find out how should I invest? Where am I going to get the biggest return for my dollar? And my, as someone has said, shrouds don't have pockets. You can't carry that stuff with you. Paul said it's certain. You brought nothing in, you'll take nothing out, 1 Timothy 6. That's all just to bless us and help bless us and get us by in this life. But through it all, we've got to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In doing that, we're making an investment in eternal life. Or look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18. Probably somewhat well known, not preached on that often. Or I could even get back up into verse 16. I could even go back earlier, the whole chapter. Paul's talking about, well, like in verse 8, we're troubled on every side. Yet not distressed, we are perplexed. Ever been perplexed about something? You kind of don't know what to do. But he said, we're not in despair. God will show us. Persecuted, but we're not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Who was that? Phillips? I never forgotten. Was that his translation somewhere in biblical literature? Where, you know, these modern translators are giving us uh, current contemporary translations. One of them was pretty good here because it gives the picture of the boxer and his ring. And it said, knocked down, but not knocked out. Cast down, but not destroyed. Knocked down, but not knocked out. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Verse 11, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Now, he's looking at the end there. End time. Resurrection. Assuming that Paul dies, he's looking forward to the resurrection. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause, his understanding of where he's headed, the glory of God, it, that's the cause. And for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And look at verse 17. Here's the crucial verse. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's both light and temporary worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, the reason being this, the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which aren't are eternal. Now we, we stumble up on this 17th verse, but we stumble up on this in light of all these other passages as well. We know that our light affliction which is just for a moment works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that's eternal reward there the light affliction that we go through our little trial that we have a physical trial or finding our little trial that we go through all the trials that we go through, all of them combined, Paul said they're just for a moment and they're a light affliction. And Paul went through a lot. And he said it's a light affliction. It's a light affliction and it's temporary. 
But the end is that it works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight. Weight, weight like a heavy trophy, a heavy reward. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's awesome. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. That's awesome. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. So they must have been doing what the apostles had taught them to do. And that is rejoice in times of trial. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season he recognized it was temporary as well. If need be, <coughs> you are in heaviness through manifold trials. So we're talking about our lot in this life is suffering and our lot in the next is eternal glory. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor, and there's that word, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The well-known two verses in Mark 10, 29 and 30, Jesus said that there's no man that hath given up mother, father, brother, sister, houses, lands, but for my sake in the Gospels, and he'll receive them back a hundredfold now in this life. But did you notice what he starts off saying, giving them up? This is the life of suffering. You don't have to give anything up in the next life. Once you have it, it's eternal. Here you get something, you give it up. You have to give it up. That represents the suffering of this life. But he does say right there also that there is blessing promised here as well, that you'll receive them back a hundredfold now in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Again, I see a big separation between our lot in this life, which is suffering, and our lot in the next life, which is eternal life. Now, he doesn't mean to deny that we have eternal life now, but in the special way that that is eternal life, there are no more bodily trials or afflictions, nothing that concerns the flesh anymore. In Luke 24, verses 25 and 26, so it's true in our Lord's own life. Jesus talking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus rebukes them and said, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that Moses and the prophets said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things? What's the rest of that verse say? Suffering in this life and to enter into his glory. Look at it yourself. Luke 24, 26, I think, is the verse. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and then to enter into his glory? There's always a division between those two topics. If you can remember those two words, suffering for now, and it's not like, suffering of defeat because paul said nay in all these things that appear to be suffering we're more than conquerors through him that loved us he said nothing can separate us from god but god you say well then why does god have to do it well we've just been talking about that it builds something in us that can't be built any other way not by machinery not by man not by tools it can only be built by difficulty and by trial and by tribulation by suffering in a word in this life suffering this life is the life of suffering it's a life of victory as well but whenever we're looking at it from this broad perspective he said that you should have understood this that christ first of all had to suffer before he could enter into his glory and of course we've got twofold aspects of the advent of christ we could say first advent was the time of suffering and the second will be a time of the manifestation of his glory I'm still in Peter, 1 Peter 1. Look at verse um, 11 and see if we don't fall, find the same chronology here. You see, it's always suffering, then glory, crucifixion, then crowning. And John's not complaining about any crucifixion or suffering then. He knows that it's for eternal glory and it's for some very worthwhile benefits even in the here and the now. I'm in 1 Peter 1.11, speaking of Christ again. Uh, here he has reference to the Old Testament prophets. They searched what or what manner of time. They were trying to understand the chronology of their prophecies. Which ones, to speak in New Testament terminology, which ones had to do with first advent and which ones had to do with second advent? Searching what or what manner of time. It was a question of chronology they were looking for. And, of course, they couldn't understand it. Daniel 12.4 tells us that in the last days, Many would run to and fro and knowledge would be increased. They would search through the prophetic books and God would reward that searching with increased prophetic knowledge. 
searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified, the Holy Spirit, in the prophets. When it testified beforehand, watch the order, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Turn with me while we're back here at the end of the Old Testament to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. Hebrews 2, 10. For it became him, speaking of God the Father, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons, now he's talking about us there, in bringing many sons unto glory, notice that word, it became him. In other words, this was the necessary pattern or process. The only way God could bring many sons unto glory was to set down here a pattern son, one after whose example we could follow. So it became him, in order to bring many sons unto glory, to make the captain, or it could be translated the author, that speaks of Jesus, to make the captain of their, referring to the sons of God, their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, Jesus had no moral or spiritual defects in him. There was nothing that needed to be perfected in that sense in the Son. Perfect or perfected or perfection in Greek can also mean complete or completion. And Jesus had a whole, he had, God the Father had a plan for him, and that plan was finally climaxed in the sufferings and the death of Christ. Apart from that, we have no salvation. If Christ did not die and resurrect, we are yet in our sins, then Paul tells us. And so in order, to, in order to do something about bringing many sons unto glory, as we've read in other passages, we have to go through some suffering as well. But there was a pattern son, a pattern example that had to be set forth first, and that was through Jesus' life. And Paul tells us, writing here in Hebrews 2.10, in order to do that, then he had to make the captain of their salvation complete through sufferings. You're not completed apart from sufferings. You can't be. You haven't finished your course and run your race yet. Jesus could have gone through his whole life, worked all the miracles, and then just said, now I'm through and I'm going to send back to the Father. There's no way then that he could have identified with us and bore in his body the horrors of the divine punishment for our sin and our guilt. Jesus bore it in his own body, 1 Peter 2.24, to his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. He bore the penalty for our sins. He bore the divine wrath and he bore the divine curse. Paul said, cursed is the one who is hung up on a tree. He bore the divine curse. He bore, he didn't become a curse. He bore the curse. He bore the divine wrath for us. He was completed through sufferings. We're not complete apart from them. We hear in our charismatic land today a sugar-coated message of faith and material prosperity and no trials and no holiness but that's not the biblical message though paul tells us not only must we have a good relationship with other men follow peace with all men but he said well you must be holy or you won't see the lord romans 12 or hebrew hebrews 12 14 follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord we're perfected through that Let's not forget also in the same book, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 40. <laughs> we don't like to read this. We like to say, yeah, that was back for them in those days, but now God, having provided some better thing for us, we're looking forward to it. Well, I believe we're going to be like the saints of old, like Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He chose. He said, I refuse to be called Pharaoh's son, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Because you know what? Both the pleasures and the afflictions are both temporary. They're both temporary. One is, it, one, well, as Paul tells us in Romans 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. One is simply an investment in eternal death. You enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season that is an investment in eternal death. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Now, you turn that around and put a little affliction in there, a little Christian affliction for the word's sake, Matthew 13, that is an investment in eternal glory. I hope this message is coming through loudly and clearly to you. 
I'm smiling while I'm preaching it. Some of you aren't. We ought to pause right now and make you all get up and run around the building twice. Well, let's start reading here. Verse 35. Women receive their dead, raised to life again. Now, we just read some positive things from, you know, the beginning of the chapter down to the 35th verse, 35a. And others were tortured. Uh oh. <laughs> Now look at verse 33. They subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. They'd preach well in Tulsa. Quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword. That would be great in Fort Worth. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Where are we now? In Arkansas, England, Arkansas. And others were tortured. Tortured? <laughs> Say, I don't want that. I just don't want that. Well, Paul got it. He said in Galatians 6, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. So just leave me alone. He said, let no man trouble me anymore because I'm an old stalwart of the faith. I bear, <laughs> I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. So did the ancient saints, friends. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. We'll let you go. You see this little plum we're holding out here for you? We'll let you go not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Remember, there's a first resurrection. And those that are resurrected in the first resurrection, we read in Revelation 20, upon these the second death hath no power. They wanted a better, there's another resurrection, a resurrection of all the wicked dead that follows the millennium, at the end of the millennium. And you don't want to be there, that's the great white throne judgment, when you and all that stand before God, the wicked dead that are resurrected are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. They wanted to obtain a better resurrection. They knew there, were more than one, there was more than one resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, now, let me just get ahead of the story to say that there is going to be an end-time group of people that do not die but are alive. They will be those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. So you don't have to die. You don't have to confess that you're going to die to fulfill Hebrews 11. But there will be some other things here that you experience, like some temptation, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, maybe, of whom the world was not worthy. I like that phrase. The world wasn't worthy of these great people. And you think the world wasn't worthy. Yeah, that's right. What I'd rather say is, is we aren't, they aren't worthy of being here in the world. We like to look up to our Anthony's and Cleopatra's of whom the world was not worthy. It didn't deserve having such holy, pure people in its midst. The world didn't deserve having, having such righteous, holy men and women of God. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise that is of the Messiah. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And one final passage here into this first point would be over in Romans chapter 2. I like this verse also. The Bible's just filled with truth. Some of us are filled with the Bible. <laughs> so you remember where all these verses are. I've had a blessed week. I've probably studied about 12 hours every day this week. Just study. Just read and read and read and read. You just absorb and absorb. And you're just looking forward to an opportunity to squeeze a little bit of it out. Romans 2.7. Well, let me get verse 6 in. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. God will render. The righteous judgment of God. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by... Now, that one big phrase, patient continuance, is just one word in Greek that means, again, endurance. But you could leave it that. I don't care. I know what he means. To them who by patient continuance, well, let's say endurance, since that's the way we've understood it from Revelation 1.9. Notice how endurance always gets brought up. And what do you think's in the background if he says endurance? You've got to have tribulation or there's nothing to endure over, right? So we've already got that here as well. We've already got two of those things, both tribulation and endurance. To them who by endurance and well-doing, and look what they're seeking for. And he said, there's nothing wrong with seeking for this. I mean, you better seek for it. To them who by 
patient continuance in well-doing, seek for, he mentions three things we're seeking for, glory and honor and immortality. Then you should have a comma after that in the King James because he says to them who through patient endurance and well-doing are seeking for this, well, to them, to them what? If, if you have a to them, you've got to have what's to them, right? To them something. Well, what's to them? Eternal life. Eternal life in all of its fullness there. He speaks of three things they're seeking for, glory and honor and immortality. Someone told me the other day, that's what I'm seeking for is glory. And I said, well, good, that's in the next life. <laughs> it's good to seek for it, but it's in the next life, though. It's not in this life. In this life, here's what you'll have, patient continuance and well-doing with tribulation as the backdrop. But it's good to be seeking for glory and inner honor and immortality. God promises eternal life. The converse is in verse 8 and following. But unto them that are contentious, that is against the truth, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. To them, here are two things, indignation and wrath. And you should really have a period after that. Unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, then two things are unto them, indignation and wrath. Then he goes on to make another statement in verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. So it really ends up saying four things. Indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish, and that's of the worst sort that you are not delivered out of. So what are we on here in Revelation 1-9? I'm just saying that John's well qualified to write to the saints about tribulation. He experienced that himself, and this is the way the Lord gave me this message last week. I, I had this plan last year in the fall, but this is the way he gave it to me last week. Suffering is our lot in this life. That's just it. You know, whenever, you've, whenever you can agree with that with your whole heart, and I don't mean with a sour look, but agree that's what the Bible does teach. Suffering is my lot in this life. Now, I know the joy of the Lord is my strength. And Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. But if people would just, if they could just have that revelation given to them and they would accept it, then maybe they wouldn't be so surprised throughout their life. Suffering is our lot in this life. And in the next life, our lot is glory. We're standing now in hope of the glory of God. But all these other things are what give us all the endurance and experience and the hope that doesn't make us ashamed because we know that God's going to ultimately work in us this exceeding great and eternal weight of glory that he speaks of in 2 Corinthians 4. Secondly, from Revelation 1-9, I'm saying that John was here in exile. Why was he banished? Well, I've said, verse 9 tells us, the Ephesian authorities somehow interpreted the teaching and preaching of, God, of, of John in a certain way as to result in his banishment. See, the Ephesian authorities, the Ephesian authorities are the ones evidently who banished John. Now, that might be under the influence of the emperor or, or maybe the emperor is under the influence of the local authorities who are on the scene and can report to him. Be that as it may, in either case, John tells us I'm here for the word of God and for Jesus' testimony. All right, well, try to reconstruct, try to reconstruct, let's say, is a better word, that situation. John's preaching the word of God, the testimony of Jesus. He's preaching that in Ephesus because he tells us, that's why I end up here, because of my preaching. The Ephesian leaders evidently interpret John's preaching as anti-world and uh, either seditious or potentially seditious. They certainly interpret it as rocking the boat and not being, um, um, what shall we say, conducive to the carrying on of normal public life and living. Why? Because he was probably preaching a, a striving message of faith and holiness. And so the Ephesian authorities, you know, they hear all that. He's preaching of this world's passing away and a better world's coming. He that does the will of God abides forever. He that loves this world will die with this world. It doesn't go over very well in the community. That doesn't sound very, very good. Somehow, John is saying something that is cast in such a light, and maybe they're not casting it, they take him for what he says, that the Ephesian authorities interpret that, they construe that as being seditious 
or potentially seditious. Now, what are you saying? Another kingdom's coming? You serve a greater, higher king? Well, we're going to have to report to the king of the Roman Empire over that one. This message will be continued.